much. So today we continue our discussion of neutrino oscillations and neutrino phenomenology. So let's first recap what we did yesterday. Um, and we looked, at, apart from a little bit of brief history about neutrinos and their basic, um, in the standard model, the basic properties, we have derived what I would call kind of the master formula for neutrino oscillations, which was given in terms of a sum over the uh, massive neutrinos of u alpha i star, u beta i, e to the minus i, delta m square i1 l divided by 2e modulus squared. Uh, with, uh, as we discussed yesterday, the delta m square i1 defined as mi squared minus m1 squared. And this describes neutrino oscillations in vacuum. Uh, so what we want to do uh, now is to look at neutrino oscillations when they happen in a medium, when, when neutrinos travel through a medium. The medium could be the Earth, the Sun, supernovas, and um, the early universe. So today's lecture will focus, first of all, on uh, finishing up on neutrino oscillations. So we look at uh, neutrino oscillations in matter. And then I want to apply what we have learned in terms of neutrino oscillations to the, what has happened so far in neutrino experiments. So we'll give you a very brief kind of overview of the current status of knowledge of neutrino properties, um, going through the various uh, experiments, uh, neutrino atmospheric, atmospheric neutrino experiments, reactor neutrinos, etc., etc. So we look at neutrinos in experiments to build up a picture of what we know about neutrinos, and we'll summarize that current knowledge of neutrino properties. Essentially, what we know are the parameters that have been measured in neutrino oscillation experiments. So mass square differences, not the absolute mass, and we know about mixing angles, and we start having some hints in terms of CP violation. But there are still lots of questions that still need to be answered, and that is what I will uh, focus afterwards. So what are the open questions? And uh, this from an experimental uh, phenol point of view. Uh, we'll look at the theory starting with uh, tomorrow. Now, I want to give you an idea of the questions and how we address them, because as I said, there is really a very broad experimental program which is already happening now and for the next uh, 10, 15 years. So you can expect to have kind of news on a nearly continuous uh, basis. And the first one, the one we are going to focus today, is the nature of neutrinos. Uh, I said yesterday that in my point, from my point of view, among kind of the, the open questions that there are in neutrino physics, um, in my view, this is kind of the, the first top priority, uh, possibly together with electronic CP <coughs> violation. And this, for me, is so important because, as I discussed yesterday, neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana depending on the conservation of lot of lepton number. And therefore, this kind of informs how we extend the standard model <coughs> to explain neutrino masses, to explain the baryonic symmetry of the universe, uh, etc., etc. So that is the plan of today's lecture. So let's start looking at neutrino oscillations in matter. So if you think of neutrinos going through a medium, they can interact with the protons, neutrons, electrons in the background. And if you are in the early universe, there will also be uh, the antiparticles, there could be muons, etc., depending on the temperature you're looking at. So generically, if you think of the scattering probability, uh, the cross-section is very, very, very small. You know that because... Okay. Let's look at the scattering cross-section. <coughs> okay. 
just on kind of dimensional grounds, what do you expect this cross-section to roughly be? I'm thinking of a neutrino which is scattering off a proton, for instance, at 1 GV, well, not 1 GV, at uh, uh, 10 GV. So what is the coupling which is relevant? We'll do this, I'm doing this now because I'm going to do this again in the last lecture where we talk about neutrinos in the early universe. So how do you describe neutrino interactions? What is the, your Lagrangian? There will be a G Fermi squared. There will be a G Fermi squared. Yes, so first of all, you are below, very below the mass of the W, is charge current interactions. So a four fermion interaction can describe your process, and so you will have a GF squared. And then you need to compensate with energy the right units. And so by in particular, uh, if uh, the protons is at rest as it happens when you're interacting in a medium, but not in the early universe, this will be something like the energy neutrino and the mass of the proton, something of this kind. And so if you plug in numbers, you will get something which is 10 to the minus 38 centimeters squared for an energy of a GV. So this is a weak cross-section, so it's really very, very small. If I take a GV neutrino, for instance, and uh, an Earth density, which is roughly a few grams per centimeter cube, then uh, kind of your mean free path is 10 to the, four, um, 10 to the 14 meters. So uh, there's no way you stop these neutrinos. However, the neutrinos can still feel the background, not through uh, an incoherent um, scattering, but through a forward elastic scattering. So neutrinos undergo forward elastic scattering. So this does not stop neutrinos, but it modifies their effective mass. Like photons in a plasma, for instance. So what is the relevant process? You will have a neutrino coming in. You have your background, for example, of electrons. You can have a charge current interaction. And if you have neutrinos of any flavor, you can also have a neutral current interaction via the Z. This with electrons, protons, and neutrons. Now, how do we take this into account in neutrino oscillations? So generically, the problem is very complex to treat because you have now to look to do quantum field theory in a background. But we can do a little bit of a neuristic approach to it, and we can simply treat the background and average over it and find a term that we can add to the Hamiltonian. Remember yesterday, when we talked about neutrino oscillations, we looked at the eigenstates of the um, propagating um, operator, therefore the Hamiltonian. So what we want to do here is find a modification, an interaction term to add to the free Hamiltonian, and that will give me, the, will describe the propagation, and with that we will find uh, the new probabilities in matter. So that is what we are going to try to do, and in order to do that we start with the Hamiltonian that we have. Let's look just at the charge current part, and the neutral current uh, works exactly in the same way. So I'm looking at the Hamiltonian, which is at the momentum. Effectively, this is zero momentum exchange. So I'm looking at the four fermion interaction. So I have a GF, and then I have my terms, E bar, gamma mu, P left E, and the neutrino part, nu E bar, 
gamma mu, p left nu e. So this is the Hamiltonian which describes this process. Well, I already did. Uh, in reality, normally you would have e bar nu e, uh, and nu e bar e, and I've just already done a first transformation to separate the background part from the propagating part. So now what I do, I average over the background. So when I take the average over the background, So I average so, um, the E bar, gamma zero E part, and when I average this over the distribution I have of electrons, uh, for instance, in the Earth or the Sun, this is simply the number density of electrons. This is for the gamma zero part. Now, I will have also the gamma one, uh, two, and three part, and but this, uh, it gives me something which is the average of the velocities. Now, my background, the average velocity is zero in the Earth. This might not be the case, for instance, in the early universe. So there, things are slightly different, a bit more complicated. And similarly, when I take the um, parts with gamma five, I get the spin, the average of the spin, and the average of the elicities, which again, for like the Earth or the Sun, is again zero. So the only term which really matters is this one here. And this, the way it acts is, if I go and look at the dispersion relation, your energy for the neutrino is now modified in this way, this momentum as before, but now you have a term which is the square root of 2, gf, and e. This is the result. In, um, in one of the references that I showed yesterday, the paper by De Gouvea, there's a nice derivation on how you can get to this result. Um, you forget about the masses, you neglect the masses for the time being, you look at the Dirac equation in presence of the background, you expand in terms of plane waves, and then you will get this dispersion relation. And because you're expanding plane waves, you get the plus sign for neutrinos and the minus sign for ne antineutrinos. That's the reason why you have this difference, uh, plus for neutrinos and minus for antineutrinos. It, as I said, it's a kind of a... Um, approximated way to look at the problem. Do it properly, you need to renormalize your propagators, etc., etc., in the background, which is, however, a very difficult task, and the end result is this anyway. These are called the potentials, and you see it here, because this is your kinetic term, and this acts as a potential. That's why they are called uh, in this way. Um, and this is called the potential for the electron neutrons. This is the charge current part. And similarly, you can obtain uh, the neutral current components. Uh, so the, for the E mu and tau neutral current, you get, uh, again, the square root of 2 gf the number of neutrons divided by two for neutrinos and the minus for the antineutrinos. So uh, let me, I have it here as well, the square root of two, G, F, and E. This is the charge current part. And these are the terms that now I use to add to the Hamiltonian where I will have the usual part, which acts as the uh, free Hamiltonian, and to this I will add the interacting part, which is given in terms of these potentials. 
Now, it's much easier to treat the problem in the flavor bases rather than uh, the massive bases, as we did yesterday, because the flavor bases, in the flavor bases, these terms are diagonal. Uh, these interactions don't change the flavor of neutrinos. The standard model don't change uh, flavor. So if you start with a new alpha, you will end up with a new alpha. So we can go to the uh, flavor bases. So let's look at the Hamiltonian now. So we, let's start with uh, the free part. So if I look at the Hamiltonian in vacuum, applied to its own eigenstates. What will I have in here in the evolution equation? What will be this matrix? The Hamiltonian applied to its own eigenstates, what does this give me? The eigenvalues on the diagonal, right? This is my starting point because now I can go into the flavor bases by applying a rotation to the massive states. Okay, we can do that. <laughs> So now I go into the flavor bases. Using the fact that nu alpha is equal to u alpha i nu i. So I can apply this rotation here and here. And in this way, I will get the evolution equation in the flavor basis. So now for new alpha, new beta, the evolution will be given by u, e1, 0, 0, e2, u dagger, new alpha, new beta. Yeah, well, actually, I have a U here and a U dagger here. So I can do this uh, in a two by two. Remember that the mixing matrix is simply cos theta minus sin theta sin theta cos theta. I can do the multiplication of the three matrices. And what I get is the minus delta m squared divided by 4e cos 2 theta delta m squared divided by 4e sine theta, delta m squared divided by 4e sine 2 theta, Bet better be emission, delta m squared divided by 4e cos 2 theta, applied to nu alpha, nu beta. Notice that I also took away on the diagonal common terms. Common terms in the diagonal become terms equal e to the i something, which is common to all the terms in the probability. And when I square that, it goes to 1. So I can take away terms which are the same on the diagonal. And that's why I end up with delta m squares rather than the energies itself. Okay, so this is the evolution equation in the flavor basis. Uh, indeed, I mean, so this is much simpler, but this is a good starting point now to look at the matter effects. Because in this basis, I have just to add a term on the diagonal for the different 
neutrinos. So, for instance, if we look at uh, new E into new mu conversion, new E, new mu, I will have those terms there to which I have to add the potential square root of 2, GF, and E, which is the charge current one, and the neutral current one, neutral current. Then I have the off-diagonal term that I've written, same off-diagonal term, and here I have that term there plus the neutral current one. New alpha, new beta. In doing this step, what I've used is that my full Hamiltonian is the free Hamiltonian, which when applied to the states, um, gives me that term, plus the interacting Hamiltonian, which is given in terms of the charge current and neutral current potentials. So that's what I did. First of all, I can get rid of these terms for the same reason as before. These are common terms in the evolution. Therefore, when I take the probability and I take the modulus squared, this goes to 1. So I can get rid of them. And now I have to solve this problem. Generically, this problem is a very complex one. Yes? To 0. Because when I evolve the states, in the evolution, those will end up being like this, with the state 1, plus the same thing, state 2, plus the same thing, state 3. And when I take the probability, so when I take then what we did yesterday in the two neutrino case, and I take, uh, I projected states over the eigenstates, etc., etc. But these terms are the same. So I can take them in front to whatever expression I have, and then I can take the modulus square and they go away. Is that clear? Okay. So, generically, this is a very, very um, difficult problem to solve because the, this number density can be time and space dependent. Instance, neutrinos uh, being produced in the center of the sun and traveling towards the Earth side, you see a density which changes nearly exponentially. And so that can be um, a very complicated uh, problem. There are two limiting cases which are interesting experimentally and can be solved uh, analytically. Uh, and uh, that is what we are going to look at uh, uh, right now. So let's first of all look at the simplest case that I can think of, the case in which the number density is constant. Um, generically, uh, the number density will change because neutrino travel through media and media can uh, have densities which change. However, this is a good approximation when I look at neutrinos traveling through the Earth in long baseline neutrino oscillation experiments. <coughs> this means neutrinos which go through the crust, um, a typical distance 300 kilometers or in the case of Dune, 30, uh, 1,300 kilometers, so neutrinos essentially just see the crust of the Earth, and there you can take the density to be um, constant. And in this case, we can solve the problem uh, analytically uh, exactly. So let's look at the constant density case. <coughs> so how do I solve uh, that um, evolution problem? What do I need to do? which is from quantum mechanics, when you had a problem of this kind, to couple differential equations, how did you solve this problem? 
Remember, you decouple them, right? And how do you decouple them? Yes, you diagonalize this matrix here. Okay, so we can do that. So we need to find the eigenvalues and we need to find the, the mixing angle which diagonalizes the matrix. Just as a warm up, if I had no potential, so if I'm in vacuum, what are the eigenvalues? Yeah, exactly, exactly. But remember that we started from the mass basis in which the two equations were decoupled because I had E1 and E2 here and zero on the off-diagonal terms. So that meant that they were decoupled. The mass basis, and then we rotated that to find the evolution in the flavor basis and then we modified that. But so if I, in vacuum where I don't have this term, the mixing angle which diagonalizes the problem is the mixing angle in vacuum, theta, and the eigenvalues are simply the two delta m squares divided by 2e, or e1, e2, if you have not yet taken out um, the terms on the diagonal. Okay, so now we want to do this, but in matter. And so, uh, for finding the eigenvalues, you know how to find the eigenvalues or a two by two matrix, right? Which is real and there's nothing special to it. What matters for us in reality is the difference of the eigenvalues. Because again, that is what enters in the oscillation probability for the same reasons as before. I can take off the, a common term and square it and get one in the probability. So, and then I let you compute this as an exercise because as I said, uh, it's something that is easy to do. Uh, and I get the square root of delta m squared divided by 2e cos 2 theta minus square root of 2 g f and e all squared plus delta m squared divided by 2e sine 2 theta squared. So this controls the development of the oscillation. This will control, uh, for example, the oscillation length. It will tell you how long it takes for the oscillations uh, to become um, efficient. The mixing angle instead tells you uh, what is the amplitude of the oscillations, so how much you convert from one flavor to the other. And now, what is the mixing angle which uh, diagonalizes a two by two matrix, tangent to theta, in matter? A two by two real matrix. You know this, right? It's twice the off diagonal. So delta m squared divided by 2e sine 2 theta from there, that's my uh, divided by the difference of the on diagonal terms. You know this or? When I need to diagonalize a two by two matrix, right? The, if I do, a, B, B, C, the tangent to theta is 2B divided by A minus C, right? Okay. And so then I get, I take the difference between the on diagonal uh, terms and I get delta M square divided by 2E cos 2 theta minus of 2 g f and e <coughs> okay and now <coughs> we can look at the, what this uh, mixing angle is telling us and in particular we can look at three limits there can be the case in which these terms is much bigger 
than uh, these uh, parameters. It could be that they are equal, or it could be that uh, these terms is negligible. And in that case, the kind of the phenomenology that are obtained, the probabilities that are obtained are very different. So first case, the, the simplest case, if you want, is when I can neglect square root of 2, g, f, and e, because it's much smaller than 10, 10 squared divided by 2, e, cos 2, theta. But this is clearly the vacuum limit. because I must recover the vacuum a case. Notice that this is E-dependent. So there will be situations in which, for sufficiently low energies, this condition is satisfied. And then what happens in this case? Well, I can neglect this term here, and then I get simply that tangent 2 theta m is equal to tangent 2 theta. So theta m is equal to the vacuum angle. And in this case, I recover the usual, uh, uh, the usual probability. OK, so this um, is just kind of a consistency check, if you want, which is relevant at certain energies. Now, the opposite case, instead, is when the square root of 2, g, f, and e, is much bigger than delta m squared divided by 2 e cos 2 theta. And for instance, if you have go to very high energies, this condition will be satisfied if you have a broad spectrum of neutrinos. This will be the case in which we have metal domination. What is the mixing angle in this case? Any guess? Well, your tangent to theta becomes very, very close to zero. But notice that there is a minus sign in the denominator. So theta m is not zero, but is what? Is what? So when the tangent is zero. Either zero or pi, and you are picking up the pi value because you are coming in with that negative sign. So this is pi over two. You remember that in the probability, the probability depends on sine square two theta. In this case, sine square two theta m. So do you get what do you get for the probability? What is sine square two pi over two? Zero, right? So you suppress the oscillations. I mean, does this make physics sense? Yes, because what happens? So you have a neutrino of one flavor, right? And you have this neutrino interacting with the background very, very strongly. So what the background does, these are the conserved flavor. So if you start with a new alpha, you interact with the background, which gives you back a new alpha. So you, it, the background realigns constantly your flavor into the new alpha direction. And therefore, the, the neutrino is not able to translate, it transform into a new beta. It's like there are effects like this in quantum mechanics, like quantum Zeno effect. So these, uh, these oscillations get suppressed because the background kind of realigns the state into the flavor basis. OK. Now, there is the third case, which is very interesting, which is the case in which, instead, you have an exact equality between those two terms. And this is called the resonant case. So the third case is the resonant case. And is when you have an exact equality 
between this term and uh, the delta m squared divided by 2e cos 2 theta. So first of all, you say, oh, but this must uh, fine-tune the parameters. But generically, I have a spectrum of energies, and therefore there will be one energy for which this condition is satisfied. Now, what happens when you have an equality? Ah, uh, and let me say that this requires delta m squared to be positive. It's not a mass square difference. Is a, uh, sorry, it's not a mass square. It's a mass square difference. So it depends if m1 is bigger of m2 or m2 is bigger of, um, with respect to m1. So what happens in this case? What is the mixing angle? Pi over 4, right? Pi over 4. Now, <coughs> this is maximal mixing. Remember, the probability goes as sine squared 2 theta. So in this case, it will be sine squared 2 pi over 4, and sine squared pi over 2 is 1. So you have maximal conversion, independently from what is the value um, of the angle in, uh, um, in vacuum. So even if theta in vacuum is very, very small, then you still have resonant transitions and maximal oscillations. Um, just as a comment, then you say, okay, but then what happens? If I send the angle to zero, I should not end up with oscillations. And this is not reflected on, from this formula here, because this is true independently on uh, the value of theta. I can send theta to zero, and I can still satisfy this condition. What happens, however, that we should not forget that we have also that uh, difference of the eigenvalues which control the distance that you need for the oscillations to become active. If your angle theta becomes very, very small, you see that the first on resonance, the first term is zero, uh, and therefore your oscillation length becomes infinite. So you end up not having oscillations, not because of the mixing angle, but because of the, the oscillation length, which so becomes too long. So the limit is... Well, so, when, with the mixing angles, you restrict them between 0 and pi, because otherwise you just uh, reproduce what happens in that case. Um, you change um, the sign here, and then you kind of redefine uh, your hierarchy of masses. You can do that, but it's simpler just to restrict uh, your definition of the angles, uh, and uh, that is what uh, typically is done. Okay, so this explains us uh, what happens with the um, oscillations in matter. And uh, just uh, to complete, I mentioned it a few times already, the probability is then given by sine square 2 theta m and then sine square uh, Ea minus Eb L divided by 2. I don't derive that result because that is exactly the same thing we've done yesterday when we computed the neutrino oscillations in vacuum. The computation is exactly the same, but using phi time instead of theta and the difference in energies rather than the delta m squares. Okay. So this is the case of uh, um, neutrino oscillations in matter with a constant density. We want to look also the case in which the density can be varying because this is a case which is relevant, for instance, in the sun, in supernovas, and other um, astrophysical situations. So here the things become more complicated. So let's look at the varying density case. So we have to start from the usual um, case as before. So we start with the 
that formula for the evolution of the states, nu alpha and nu beta, which, if you, um, as I've written before, is delta times squared divided by 4e cos 2 theta plus the potential, which now depends on distance and time, sorry, the charge current one, and the other terms that I'm not going to rewrite, we have written them earlier. Is it clear? We, we take again, I'm rewriting again the evolution equation in the flavor basis. Okay. Now, what we do, we try to diagonalize this to separate the two differential equations and solve the problem. So I define my new alpha as a combination of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, new i. These are uh, the kind of the propagation states. And uh, if the... Um, the density is varying, is improper to call them eigenstates. Indeed, they are not. So I do this, and then what I need to do um, is apply this matrix. This is the matrix which diagonalizes the Hamiltonian at a given time. This will give me the, the two eigenvalues at a given time. This is how I define this matrix, right? It's the matrix which diagonalizes the Hamiltonian. Now, and we do what we did before. Now I express these in terms of these propagation states, and then I try to diagonalize that. Unfortunately, it does not work. And you can see immediately why. It does not work because the moment I do I d over dt of u, which depends on t of my state new i, and here I have a U dagger, HM, U, and the states here, new I. Here, I, therefore, I will have a new I1, new I2 similarly here. I have to take the derivative also of the mixing matrix. And that will end up giving me off diagonal terms in the evolution. So, Oh, one can do it, uh, uh, but I leave that to you. It's not a difficult exercise uh, uh, to do, keeping in mind that this is a two by two matrix. Uh, let me write it here. So I, as we are dealing with a two by two, this will be a cos theta, which depends on T, minus sine theta, which depends on T, etc. as usual for a two by two matrix. So I leave to you as an exercise to take this time derivative and then make this uh, two by two uh, product of matrices, remembering that when I apply u dagger u to the Hamiltonian, I defined it in such a way to get the, off di the diagonal uh, matrix. And so what I get is that the evolution is now new i1, new i2, is equal to Ea and Eb as I wanted. But I get minus i theta dot 
the time derivative of the angle theta. And remember, the angle theta, well, I, I canceled it, but depends, as I defined before, on the, pot uh, on the potential, which therefore depends on the number densities, where it's there that the time dependence uh, kind of comes about. And here it needs to be Hermitian, so this will be a uh, theta dot, I theta dot, t, new I1, new I2. So I've not decoupled the two equations, and indeed I cannot decouple the two equations. So the thing I do, I take the problem, I write a code, and I solve it numerically. There is one case which is interesting ex um, experimentally and is also um, uh, interesting theoretically if these terms are there but are subdominant. In that case, I can still solve the problem, quasi decouple the two equations, and therefore solve uh, the issue. This is called the adiabatic case because there is law. Um, and it's the case in which uh, the theta dot term is much smaller than the difference uh, of the of on diagonal terms. In this case, I can neglect uh, at first order the of diagonal terms and can still solve the problem. And uh, the condition for this to be satisfied, so the ad adiabaticity condition, so called. <coughs> kind of formalizes this, requires that 2 theta dot over Ea minus Eb, which I can rewrite expressing theta dot and Ea and Eb in terms of the potential. I can rewrite this in terms of sine 2 theta delta m square divided by 2e divided by Ea minus Eb cubed, and then the modulus of the charge current potential. I take the time derivative, the modulus of that, and it needs to be much smaller than 1. So you see, it's energy dependent, so at uh, um, there will be energies for which I can satisfy these conditions and energies for which I cannot. In fact, in the sun, for kind of um, energies, uh, low, uh, sufficiently low energies, this um, um, is uh, satisfied, and then um, energies for which in, indeed uh, the diabetic case is not. In fact, this is very important when I try to analyze uh, the results of ne solar neutrino oscillations. And here there is an effect uh, which builds on what we have uh, discussed, which is called the MSW effect, which explains uh, solar neutrino oscillations, um, and it's called MSW because of Mikhail Smirnov and Wolfenstein, who have first discussed, uh, discussed it and the uh, matter effects in neutrino oscillations. So the MSW effect applies to solar neutrinos, and we will see in a few minutes, solar neutrinos are electron neutrinos in the 0.1 to 10 MeV. So they are produced roughly at a tenth of the radius, where the density is very high. So if we look back at the formulas that I have erased, so the, um, the new E 
at that point is mainly one of the heavy states, so it's mainly a new, uh, let me call it new I2. This is the case of uh, matter domination. <laughs> and remember, applies for sufficiently large energies is energy dependent. Remember what we said in the case of matter domination, I have that the angle is pi, um, pi over two, and therefore Ne is the heavy one. Corresponds mainly to the, interaction, the heavy interaction state. Um, you can also think of it in the evolution, I don't have a, uh, the, the formulas here are handy. But you remember that you have new E, new mu, and you had the potential in the EE position. So that tells you that that's mainly the heavy state. Okay, now be, in adiabaticity, if the adiabatic condition satisfies, which it is for this kind of energy, then this state evolves slowly. So it remains in the heavy state till the surface of the sun. So the state will evolve without jumps in presence of adiabaticity. adiabaticity. And will end up being new to on the surface of the sun. And then I can ask what is the probability of a, a, a solar neutrino that starts in a new E to arrive on the surface of the sun and then from there it freely propagates till you can detect some of them on, uh, in uh, our detectors, for instance, Super Kamiokande or Snow. So what do we do? So if we ask what is the probability of new E remaining a new E, what did I ask? on the surface, what do I need to do? I need to take the projection of the state on the surface, which is nu2, over nu e modulus squared. And this, if you remember, you have nu e nu mu, and then you have cosine, minus sine, sine, cosine, nu1, nu2. So the component is the sine. So this is sine squared theta. You are on the surface, so this is sine squared theta in vacuum. Ah, but that's very interesting. So even if I have very small mixing angles, I can have a very large probability of transition from one flavor to the other, or conversely, a very small um, survival probability for the electron neutrinos. And uh, which is somewhat counterintuitive. And this is how we explain uh, the data where we observe from uh, the sun. Indeed, the mixing angle is not particularly small, um, is around uh, 30 degrees. But this explains the very large transition um, that we have observed and how we solve the solar neutrino problem. It's actually even more interesting than this because this is true if you have matter domination uh, at the start. And we said matter domination, so let's do a PEE, survival probability is a function of the energy. Neutrino energy. So for energies, let's say here I have 10 MeV. Okay, you have that the, prob the survival probability is a sine square two theta. But if I go to very low energies, you remember um, then the term delta m square divided by 2e at very low energy becomes big and therefore dominates with respect to the square root of 2 g f n e. So you recover the vacuum limit. What is the probability in the, the survival probability in vacuum is 1 minus the conversion probability that we computed yesterday. 1 minus 
sine square 2 theta, and then you have the sine square delta m square L divided by 2e, but you need to average it over, so you have a one half. So here you have the MSW effect, here you are in vacuum. with a transition like that. And so, and experimentally, we have experimental points here and experimental points here, and we start having some experimental points even in between. And this would be a, a really a, a fantastic confirmation of our understanding of neutrino oscillations, uh, even in the meta, which is a more complex uh, problem. And uh, the same that happens in uh, the sun. Okay, so this concludes uh, the uh, discussion about neutrino oscillations in vacuum, in matter. So now you are equipped to understand any uh, experiment, neutrino oscillation experiment of the past and of uh, the future. So now let's look at these uh, neutrino experiments then. Uh, well, we've done an hour. So this is a good moment to do, but let's do just five minutes because what comes next is a little bit more descriptive. We are looking at slides. It's not very uh, heavy mathematically. Um, so just five minutes of break.
So let's start again. And I wrote here on the board the probabilities which are um, relevant for the experiments we're going to discuss, uh, which is the past up to now. For the future, uh, some of these probabilities need to take into account uh, um, higher order terms. Uh, it's just a recap from yesterday's lecture and uh, today's. So it's nothing new with respect to what we discussed uh, already. So first of all, how do you produce and detect neutrinos? Well, the interactions they have are weak interactions, so charge current and neutral current interactions. And uh, we use the slides. So um, for instance, the typical thing, you have a beta decay. Um, so you have D going to you, you exchange W, and here you have an electron and uh, an electron anti, uh, well, OK, a positron and uh, an electron neutrino in uh, this case. Um, and as we discussed yesterday, we know that this is an electron neutrino because uh, you have observed uh, the associated electron. The other, so this is one, the typical way to produce electron neutrinos, and the typical way to produce muon neutrinos is to look at the pion decay, where you produce a muon and a muon antineutrino. And you know that, that the new E component in a, from a pion beam is going to be very, very small because the branching ratio of pions into electrons is very small. And of course, you know the reason for that, the elicity, chirality, etc. right? OK. Uh, and you detect them in the same way. So for instance, you have an electron neutrino coming in, interacting with uh, a background, and background in the detectors contain electrons, protons, and neutrons. So you can have charged current, neutral current interactions, and you observe the emitted electron. And if you can, depending on the type of detector, you can see also the hadronic part. Um, if you have a muon neutrino, this will be a muon. If you have a tau neutrino, this you have a tau. Now, I have a question for you. Reactor, um, a reactor um, electron antineutrino. Can you see, uh, which oscillates, for instance, into muon neutri antineutrinos? Can you see the muon antineutrinos? Sorry? So how do, you de how do you observe the fact that it is a muon neutrino, not an electron or antineutrino? You need to see the muon. Yes. Well, it's not kinematically allowed, because if you have a 3 MeV neutrino, uh, which is the uh, typical energy for uh, reactor neutrinos, you don't have enough energy to produce the muons. Right? So uh, for example, in reactor neutrino experiments, the only channel you are interested in is, is the anti -nui into anti -nui because you cannot see anything else. That's why, for example, for reactor uh, uh, antineutrinos, really, uh, the only thing I looked at is the anti -nui into anti -nui survival probability. OK. So how do you detect neutrinos? So you look at the uh, um, uh, tracks left by the charged particles, in particular the electron, muon, or even the tau, if you can, and the hadronic part, if you have sufficient energy. And so the typical ways is uh, water Cherenkov detectors, where you see the Cherenkov light emitted by an electron which is traveling too fast with respect to its own velocity in water. Um, and this is a, a view of the, uh, of the super Kamiokande detector. This is a typical event. This is uh, from T2K. This is new muse. Uh, I would say that this is probably a new E, it's a bit fuzzy, um, uh, in the super chemical detector. Uh, the NOVA detector, this is a completely different technique. This is uh, plastic scintillators, and you see a descintillation of the light as uh, the charged particle goes through. Uh, you can see that in, uh, in iron as well. So you have iron interleaved with uh, scintillator. This is in the MINOS experiment. Um, and the, the new technique, which is the being developed right now, in addition to these ones, is a liquid argon. And in liquid argon, you can see the tracks that the particles are making. It's very interestingly, not just the um, uh, charged leptons, but also the hadronic part. And so you can reconstruct very, very well the event uh, topology. 
So what are the cross-sections? This is interesting to understand the power of the different experiments. Now, we are interested in energies for neutrino electron scattering, typically above the electron mass, at least a few MeV. And in this case, this is the cross-section. This tends to be quite small. Indeed, it's around 10 to the minus 44 centimeters squared uh, for an MeV energy. Um, and in the case of uh, the new mu um, the, or the new tau, these have only neutral current. Uh, therefore, the uh, cross-section is a bit smaller with respect to the electron neutrinos, which have also uh, charge current interactions, and you see there's a factor of a few uh, between the two. Now, the other main way to detect neutrinos is via neutrino nucleon scattering, with, for example, on three protons in water. If you are at very low energies, then uh, these uh, cross section scales as the energy squared. So below the GV, because the mass of the proton is roughly one GV, so below it will erase as a E nu squared, and above, it will go roughly as the mass of the proton and the energy of the neutrino. In reality, it's a little bit more complicated than that because uh, only in some cases you can scatter <laughs> of three nucleons, as I mentioned, uh, three protons uh, in, uh, in water, but most of the time uh, you scatter off uh, um, whatever, iron, uh, carbon, oxygen, etc., etc., and at that point the neutrino also breaks the nucleus, and you can have emission of a single nucleon, you can emission of pions, etc., and so above, in particular above GV, uh, where you are in the deep inelastic scattering region, the thing becomes very, very complicated, but this is a good kind of ballpark to understand the values of the cross-section, so this is a, um, an inverse beta decay cross-section, and you are around 10 to the mi minus 43 region. How, where, what are the neutrino sources? Well, you span basically all the energies going from the sub-EV for the relic neutrinos present in this room, um, going up to, um, uh, I mean, you see, 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17 GEV, uh, sorry, EV uh, for extragalactic neutrinos. What we are mainly looking at is here, re terrestrial, which are geoneutrinos, reactor neutrinos, solar, supernova, atmospheric, accelerator. So let me do a very kind of quick uh, um, brush through uh, the various uh, uh, experiments that have happened so far. So we start with solar neutrinos. These are uh, very copiously produced in the, in the sun through um, nuclear reactions. So you have, for example, a PP going into here, um, deuterium, positron, and neutrinos. You have various sources of neutrinos in various um, different reactions, and these are what defines the different components of the spectrum, which is here. It goes from sub-EV, uh, sub-MEV, around 0.1 uh, MEV, and below, to roughly 10 MEV. So uh, the component which uh, experiments like Super Kamiokan, the C, is this bottom uh, flux coming from uh, here, which is much smaller than the PP neutrinos, for instance, but because of what I just showed you, as the cross-section uh, scales very quickly with the energy, nevertheless, um, this is the dominant component uh, that supercoming can see given the, the threshold. And some experiments are sufficiently low threshold that they can see these PP neutrinos, and Borexina, which is the experiment which is currently running, is trying to uh, test this intermediate region, which is interesting because it's this transition region between vacuum and the MSW effect um, around uh, 1 to MeV. And the main actors in, uh, in, these, uh, in, these exper in the experimental searches for solar neutrinos are Super Kamiokande, this big water Cherenkov of detector, uh, 22 um, kilotons of uh, water uh, in terms of fiducial volume. There's no, there's no detector. Um, which instead looked not only at the charge current interactions, but also at the neutral current ones, and in this way was able to reconstruct the full flux, also the new mu and new tau components, this in 2002, and that's why I received the um, uh, Nobel Prize um, in 2015, and uh, the current experiment, uh, Borexino, which, as I said, is kind of looking at this intermediate region here. There are also other experiments using our techniques like SAGE and GALAX uh, and the, the original one, Homestake, which looked at the very low energy uh, part. 
And these are the experimental data. That's why I'm using slides because I want to show you a little bit the type of plots you see uh, in uh, um, this field. This is the new e survival probability, and these are the experimental dots. You see that they're still there, our bars are quite large, but they, you st really start seeing this transition um, region uh, here. And in that way, you can measure quite well the solar mixing angle, which, as I when I make kind of a summary in a, a few minutes, is around uh, 30 degrees. Now, atmospheric neutrinos, these are neutrinos which are produced when one uh, cosmic ray, so it's a very energetic proton or nucleus, um, hits the atmosphere, and you have there an adronic interaction, you produce lots of pions and kaons, in particular pions, uh, which then decay, uh, producing muons and uh, new muons. And it's a, a kind of a, uh, then the muon itself can decay into uh, another muon neutrino and an electron neutrino. So you have this two to one ratio, at least uh, at not very high energies. The main experiment is uh, Super Kamiokande, again, um, and this is the way, this is the original slide from uh, the talk by Kajita San at Neutrino 1998 with the evidence of neutrino oscillations. And you see here, the data. Uh, this is the zenith angle, so the direction uh, with respect to um, uh, the neutrinos come from, so from above or from below. And you see here, these are the muon neutrinos. You see the ones which are coming from below, these are the data points, and this is the prediction. is much lower than you would expect, while the ones which come from above, so I had no time to oscillate, match very well the theoretical prediction. And so this is, oh, again, as I said yesterday, this led to the Nobel Prize. Um, to Kajita in um, 2015. And this is the way to measure uh, the mixing, uh, the mass square difference, which turns out to be around 2.5, 10 to minus 3 EV squared. The relevant one is given here. You, you look at new mu into new mu oscillations, and therefore you measure this delta M square. Uh, here. Another very important experiment, which just uh, finished uh, um, a few years ago, is a MINOS experiment, which was able to also distinguish uh, new mu's from anti new mu's. Now, reactor antineutrinos, we discussed this come from uh, decays, uh, neutron decays, a typical energy um, in the MEV region, and there are two different regimes. The distance around one uh, kilometer for experiments like Daya Bay, Double Show, and Reno, and these, the, the survival probability depends on sine squared 2 theta 1 3. And this is the way in which in 2012, Double Show with uh, the um, additional information uh, from uh, Reno and, um, and T2K as well, confirmed a value for theta 1, 3, or discovered really, a value for theta 1, 3 around 9 degrees. The other regime is when the distance is much longer. This is Kamlan. Uh, in this case, instead, you are very sensitive to the delta M square 2, 1, um, and this is the way in which uh, uh, see here, uh, Kamland um, provided a very precise measurement of the delta M square to 1, around 7.5, 10 to the minus 5 EV square. And then finally, accelerator neutrinos. So you produce a beam of neutrinos from pion decays. So you have a proton beam which hits a target. Um, now, the, at the target, you have adronic interactions, you produce lots of pions. This time, you focus the pions using magnetic fields. This produces a, a pion beam, which then you let decay into a decay pipe. And uh, because the, the, these pions are all pointing in the same direction, you end up with a muon beam, um, a muon neutrino beam. And the, this, uh, these are the ones that then you um, try to detect at a certain distance. Um, now, in this case, you can tune the energy uh, and uh, fix the distance. So you can optimize your experiment to look at the first oscillation maximum, as we were discussing yesterday. And therefore, that's why you have uh, kind of uh, an average energies which match nicely the distances that you have. For example, 4 GV for Minos, 295 kilometers, you have roughly um, 700-800 MeV average energy for T2K, Nova, etc. And uh, but surely you can look for new mu into new mu oscillations. At these energies, you produce the muons in a charge current interaction, so that's kind of your, um, the first dominant signal. And in this case, the oscillation probability is given here. You are sensitive to theta 2, 3 and to delta m squared 3, 1. Now, 
in certain type of experiments, uh, not in MINOS, um, very well because it was iron, but in experiments you can see the electron tracks, for instance, in NOVA, in a Watt and Cherenkov detector, you can also look for the new mu into new E oscillations. And notice that um, this time the dependence is mainly on theta, the theta 1, 3 angle, this same angle here. But, and then I have put plus dot dot dot. Now, these contain the CP violating terms with delta and the matter effects. So this is uh, actually the oscillation probability, the channel that we are using to establish the tonic CP violation and the mass ordering, as I will discuss, however, tomorrow in, these exper in the future experiments, present and future experiments. And finally, if you are able to see the taus, then you can also look for new mu into new tau. Uh, oscillations. This is a very difficult channel. You need very high energies. And this is what Opera and Icarus did uh, a few years ago. Um, and in this case, again, the same parameters uh, matter. It is mainly the issue of looking for new tau appearance and indeed checking that you have oscillations of new mu's into uh, new taus. So this we have already said. These are some data. Uh, so here you see the MINOS uh, um, data, for instance. Um, and then this is your, uh, the predictions with no oscillations and uh, the observed values with the predictions with oscillations. So they match very, very nicely. In particular, if you see the ratio of the um, data with respect to no oscillations, so one is if you have no oscillations, as a function of the energy, you see this beautiful uh, dip, which corresponds to the first oscillation maximum. And because of this, you can measure the delta m square, uh, which controls these oscillation, which is delta m square 3, 1, very well. And this is around 2.4, 2.5, 10 to the minus 3 EV squared. Uh, these are kind of T2K data. I mean, they are beautiful signatures, absolutely beautiful. This is a summary of the delta m square 3, 2 versus sine square 2, theta 2, 3. And you see that this angle could well be maximal. We don't know, but indeed something which is 45 degrees would point to some symmetry or some principle. This is not a kind of a random value. It's quite special. So it's quite exciting in our field. Um, and uh, this is the current knowledge of neutrino properties. So, so this is a combined fit of all the experimental data from all the different sources. And this is what you get in terms of the best fit values. So we have the three angles, theta 1, 2, theta 2, 3, and theta 1, 3. So this is the one which enters into Kamland and solar neutrinos, and this is around 33 degrees. That's the best fit value. Notice that it's measured quite precisely. Uh, theta 2, 3 is around 45 degrees. We don't know yet. There's still quite some range uh, there. And theta 1, 3 uh, has gone from being known not at all, just uh, you know, 80. And for the two mass square differences, uh, here we have uh, one which is 7.4, 10 to the minus 5 EV squared, and this is 2.5, 10 to the minus 3 EV squared. So the key point here is that, first of all, they are different from zero, so neutrinos have mass, but not just that, they are also really, really tiny. So, and this points towards maybe a different origin for neutrino masses compared uh, to what you have for the other fermions. And these are the typical plots you see uh, in a neutrino um, phenomenology. So these are the values which are allowed at 2, 3, and 4, four and 5 sigma uh, uh, for the delta m squares and the mixing angle. This is delta m square uh, 3, 1, uh, which could be positive or negative. I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, with this mixing angle, uh, theta 2, 3, here you have the solar parameters, and here you have theta 1, 3, and the first uh, hints uh, towards possibly CP violation in the leptonic sector. But this is really key, the, the key message. If you have to remember one thing from this course, this is what you have to remember. Neutrinos have mass and mix, and we have to understand what is the physics beyond the standard model which is responsible for that. So now let's go back to the lectures, uh, to, the, to the board, and I want to discuss what these values tell us in terms of neutrino properties.
Okay, so what is the, the conclusions we can draw from these experimental data? So what is the current knowledge of neutrino properties? So first of all, we have two mass square differences. So having delta m square 2, 1 much smaller than delta m square 3, 1 means that you need to have at least three massive neutrinos. Otherwise, you cannot make up two different mass square differences. And how can I order the masses? So but there are two ways. In this case, the difference in mass m2 squared minus m1 squared is here, while the big one, delta m squared, three, one, separates the heavier one. This is called normal ordering for no other good reason that this is the ordering you see in quarks and charged leptons. But you have the other possibility in which you swap these. In, so you have the two heavy ones to be separated by the score, more mass square difference, and the, heavy, uh, the uh, lighter one to be much farther apart. This is called inverted ordering. And notice that in this case, Delta m square 3, 1 is positive. And here, delta m square 3, 1 is negative. So a couple of considerations. First of all, why did I put always 2 on top of 1? How do I know that? M2 is bigger than M1. Sorry. There was a flare activity and then it died down. So, <laughs> what, um, so any ideas why? Uh, well, in some sense, but there is experimental evidence for it. So the, the, these come from solar neutrinos and Kamlan as well. But in particular, solar neutrinos tells me that you have the MSW effect. Now, solar neutrinos are neutrinos, not antineutrinos. So you need to have had the MSW effect, so the, this resonance, the abeticity, et cetera, behavior in the neutrino channel. And you remember that the potential changes sign for antineutrinos. So... You, if you see the resonance uh, effects in the neutrino channel, then it means that your delta m square needs to be positive, otherwise you cannot satisfy the resonance condition, right? This tells you that the delta m square uh, being positive means that m2 is bigger than m1. And we come back to the question before, that is multiplied by cos 2 theta. So I define cos 2 theta to be positive. If I define it in a different, uh, I mean, I could swap the meaning. At that point, uh, this is what you are saying, that at that point becomes a, a choice. But if I define cos 2 theta to be positive, then M2 is bigger than M1. Um, and then the other thing I want to point out is this. So you have the ordering. The ordering is a question which is important if I try to explain the values of the neutrino masses from a theoretical perspective. Certain models will give me normal ordering, other models will give me inverted ordering. How do I test that experimentally? Now, I have the delta m square which is opposite in the two cases, but we have just discussed matter effects depend on the sign of delta m square. So if delta m square is positive, I will have enhancements of the probability in the neutrino channel, 
if delta m squared is negative, I will have enhancements in the antineutrino channel. So I can look at the two channels, see where I have enhancement and where not, and then from that I can deduce the value of the, the sign of delta m squared and therefore the ordering of the masses. We'll do that, we'll look at that a little bit more in detail tomorrow because uh, this is one of the main goals of the Dune experiment, which is due to start in five years and is under construction. Okay, um, and from this I can also express the values of the masses just in terms of the ordering and one unknown parameter. So, for instance, in the case of normal ordering, M1 is the minimal value of the masses, the, of the three masses. How can I express M2? Well, I can write this as an M2 square, of which I take the square root. I subtract and add an M1 squared. And this is the delta M squared to 1, which is there, 7.5, 10 to the minus 5 EV squared. So if I know the ordering and I know M1, I can also express, I, I also know M2 and M3, which is delta M squared 3, 1 plus M1 squared. And I can do the same in the case of inverted ordering. In this case, M3 is the minimal value of the mass, and I can express N1 and N2, which are quasi-degenerate, to be the square root of delta M square 3, 1, plus M3 squared. Well, the modulus of this. Of course, measuring M1 or M3 is really very difficult. And we'll come to that actually in the last lecture. I will mention that uh, um, very briefly tomorrow uh, concerning beta decays. And then we'll devote a little bit more time in the last lecture about uh, neutrino masses in cosmology. Okay, concerning the mixing angles. So we have these uh, three mixing angles, theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. that I already discussed there. Theta on two is around 33 degrees. Theta two is around 45 degrees. And is around nine degrees. But the key question here is really the delta phase. This is a key question because this is leptonic CP violation. We have seen CP violation in the quark sector. Now we want to know if it's there also in the lepton sector with the ultimate goal of understanding why um, these CP violating phases are there. And as I said, there start being some hints and the way uh, this kind of this island um, arises in a plot like that, theta one three delta, is because you look at the data from oscillation experiments, in particular T2K and NOVA, which depend on new mu into new E oscillations, therefore theta one three and the delta phase. This gives you a combined region for theta one three. Maybe I can show you. It's easier than to explain on the board. So um, this, a certain value of the new mu new e oscillation probability that you measure in T2K and NOVA gives you an island, um, but usually something like this, in uh, the theta-1-3 delta plane. And then you overlay that with the measurement of theta-1-3 from reactor experiments. If, but if you remember, the probability of anti new e going into anti new e in reactor experiments depends only in theta one, the, on theta-1-3. It doesn't depend on other parameters apart delta m square 3 one Therefore, in this plot, it's just a line or a band in theta-1-3. And when you combine the two things, then you are left with a region uh, a smaller region for the delta phase. It's early days. These hints are, are growing since uh, maybe two, three years ago, um, steadily in the same direction. So maybe we are seeing the, the first hints in terms of leptonic CP violation, but we need to wait confirmation. We'll get to probably around three sigma with the running of the T2K phase two and NOVA, which has been, because of these first things, have been prolonged beyond what was originally planned and will go around till 2024. And in 2025, 
26, the new generation experiments, so T2 hyper K and Dune, will start. And these will, um, if these first kind of hints for quite large values, quite large values of the delta phase are confirmed, they will get to five sigma within a reasonable number of years. So uh, we will get to a discovery of leptonic CP violation. But we have to wait and see. So this is what we know. What do we still want to understand for the future? How do we need to complete this picture of neutrino oscillations? No, sorry, of neutrino properties. So what are the open questions? In what is my mm, bah, kind of ordered list? Now, first of all, the nature of neutrinos. I discussed this already many times, the Iraq versus Majorana, the link to lepton number violation. Uh, we want to know if there is a leptonic CP violation. We need to know the absolute values of the masses, not just the mass square differences. And we want to know the precise values of the mixing angles because maybe these point towards some principle behind the flavor structure. And last but not least, we want to test the three neutrino paradigm because indeed, as we discussed uh, yesterday at the beginning, neutrinos are a portal to new physics and they could well have new interactions, they could mix with sterile neutrinos, etc. So I'm going to cover that in lecture four a bit. So test three neutrino. As I said, there are some hints of sterile neutrino, but they are quite controversial. So they, the question is, I would say, uh, quite open. OK, so in the remaining time, I have no minutes. <laughs> OK, but this is also a good point where to stop. And in that case, we can start tomorrow at looking at these questions here. I will spend quite some time on the nature of neutrinos, because uh, this is important both uh, phenomenological and uh, from a theoretical point of view. Um, then I will tell you how we can search for leptonic CP violation and the mass ordering. Uh, this is because, as I said, there are Dune and T2 hyper K, which are very big experimental efforts that uh, um, you need to understand uh, what information they can give us, etc. I will spend just uh, a few minutes about Catherine. Uh, and the search for the absolute value of neutrino masses. They just released um, the, their first data a couple of months ago. I will not really spend the time on this, and instead I will then move on to understand neutrino masses beyond the standard model. So that's the plan for tomorrow.